Hello, my class. Today we'll be reading Chapter 17 of Island of the Blue Dolphins. Storms came early with rain, and between the rains, fierce winds struck the island and filled the air with sand. During this time, I made myself another dress, but most of the days I spent fashioning a spear to catch the giant devilfish. I had seen this spear made as I had seen my father make bows and arrows, yet I knew little about it, no more than I had about the others. Still, I remembered how it looked and how it was used. From these memories, I made it after many hours and errors, sitting on the floor while Rontu slept nearby and the storms beat upon the roof. Four of the sea elephant teeth were left, and though I broke all except one, this I worked down to a head with a barbed point. I then made a ring and fastened it to the end of the shaft, and into this ring fitted the head, which was tied to a long string made of braided sinew. When the spear was thrown and struck a devilfish, the head came loose from the shaft. The shaft floated on the water, but the pointed barb was held by the string, which was tied to your wrist. This spear was especially good because it could be thrown from a distance. On the first day of spring, I went down to Coral Cove with my new spear. I knew it was spring because that morning at dawn, the sky was filled with flocks of darting birds. They were small and black and came only at this time of year. They came out of the south and stayed for two suns, hunting food in the ravines, and then flew off in one great flight toward the north. Rontu did not go with me to the beach, because I had let him out of the fence and he had not returned. The wild dogs had been to the house many times that winter, and he had paid them no heed to them. But the night before, after they had come and gone, he had stood at the fence. He stood and whined and walked up and down. It worried me to see him act so strangely and when he refused to eat, I finally let him out. Now I pushed the canoe into the water and drifted toward the reef where the devilfish lived. The water was so clear that it was like the air around me. Far down the sea ferns moved as though a breeze were blowing there, and among them swam the devilfish trailing their long arms. It was good to be on the sea after the winter storms with the new spear in my hand, but all the morning as I hunted the giant devilfish, I kept thinking of Rontu. I should have been happy, Yet, thinking of him, I was not. Would he come back, I wondered, or had he gone to live with the wild dogs? Would he again be my enemy? If he were my enemy, I knew that I could never kill him, now that he had been my friend. When the sun was high, I hid the canoe in the cave we had found, for once more it was the time the Eliots might return, and with the two small bass I had speared, though not the giant devilfish, I went up the cliff. I had planned to make a trail from the cave to my house, but it decided that it could be seen from a ship and by anyone standing on the headland. The climb was steep. As I reached the top, I paused for breath. The morning was quiet except for the noise of the little birds flying from bush to bush and the cries of the gulls who did not like these strangers. Then I heard the sound of dogs fighting. The sound came from far off, perhaps from the ravine, and taking my bow and arrows, I hurried in that direction. I went down the path which led to the spring. There were tracks of the wild dogs around the spring, and among them I saw the large ones of Rontu. The tracks led away through the ravine, which winds to the sea. I heard again the distant sound of fighting. I went slowly through the ravine because of my bow and arrows. At last I came to the place where it opens into a meadow, right at the edge of a low sea cliff. Sometimes in the summer, as a long time ago, my people had lived here. They gathered shellfish on the rocks and ate them here, leaving the shells which after many summers had formed a mound. Over this grass had grown, and a thick-leaved plant called Napen. On this mound, among the grasses and the plants, stood Rontu. He stood facing me with his back to the sea cliff. In front of him, in a half-circle, were the wild dogs. At first I thought that the pack had driven him there against the cliff, and were getting ready to attack him. But I soon saw that two dogs stood out from the rest of the pack, between it and Rontu, and that their muzzles were wet with blood. One of these dogs was the leader who had taken Rontu's place when he had come to live with me. The other one, which was spotted, I had never seen. The battle was between Rontu and these two dogs. The rest were there to fall upon whichever was beaten. So great was the noise made by the pack, they had not heard me as I came through the brush, nor did they see me now as I stood at the edge of the meadow. They sat on their haunches and barked, with their eyes fixed on the others. But I was sure that Rontu knew I was somewhere near, for he raised his head and smelled the air. The two dogs were trotting back and forth along the foot of the mound, watching, watching Rontu. 
the fight had probably started at the spring and they had stalked him to this place where he had chosen to fight. The sea cliff was behind him, and they could not reach him that direction, so they were trying to think of some other way. It would have been easier if one could have attacked him from the back and one from the front. Rontu did not move from where he stood on top of the mound. Now and again he lowered his head to lick a wound on his leg. Whenever he did, he always kept his eyes on the two dogs trotting up and down. I could have shot them, for they were within the breach of my bow, or driven off the pack, yet I stood in the brush and watched. This was a battle between them and Rontu. If I stopped it, they would surely fight again, perhaps at some other place less favorable to him. Rontu again licked his wound, and this time he did not watch the two dogs moving slowly past the mound. I thought it was a lure, and so it proved to be, for suddenly they ran toward him. They came from opposite sides of the mound, ears laid back and teeth bared. Rontu did not wait for the attack, but leaping at the nearer one, turned his shoulder, and with his head lowered, caught the dog's foreleg. The pack was quiet. In the silence, I could hear the sound of the bone breaking, and the dog backed away on three, three legs. The spotted dog had reached the top of the mound. Whirling away from the one he had crippled, Rontu faced him, but not in time to fend off the first heavy rush. Teeth slashed at his throat, and as he turned his body, struck him instead on the flank, and he went down. At that moment, while he lay there on the grass, with the dog circling warily and the pack moving toward, slowly toward him, without knowing that I did so, I fitted an arrow to the bow. A good distance separated Rontu from his attacker, and I could end the battle before he was wounded further or the pack fell upon him. Yet, as before, I did not send the arrow. The spotted dog paused and turned in his tracks, and again leaped, this time from behind. Rontu was still lying in the grass with his paws under him, and I thought he did not see that the other was upon him. But crouching there, he suddenly raised himself, and at the same time fastened his teeth in the dog's throat. Together they rolled off the mound, yet Rontu did not let go. The pack sat restless in the grass. In a short time, Rontu rose to his feet and left the despotted dog where it lay. He walked to the top of the mound and lifted his head and gave a long howl. I had never heard this sound before. It was the sound of many things that I did not understand. He trotted past me and up the ravine. When I got to the house, he was there waiting, as if he had not been away or nothing had happened. In all the time he lived, Rontu never left again, and the wild dogs, which for some reason divided into two packs, after that never returned to the headland. And that is the end of chapter 17. We'll read chapter 18 next. Have a great day.